welcome to the most excellent 80s movies podcast. It's the podcast where a filmmaker, a comedian, and their fabulous podcaster guests, podcaster and filmmaker guests, uh, walk and walk and walk our way to uh, <laughs> find the dead body of the 80s movies we think we love or <laughs> might have missed with these our grown up eyes to see how they hold up. Uh, today we're talking about Stand By Me, a movie selection from 1986. Oh man, where do you hear this? What is it, man? You guys want to go see a dead body? I want to see a dead kid. Maybe it shouldn't be a party. I'm never going to get out of this town now, my glory. You think Mighty Mouse could beat up Superman? What are you, crack? I'll kill you, I swear to God. bizarre sounding trailer for this movie ding, 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 mm -hmm. ding, 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 what is that song a so this movie is so iconic for its music and instead they were like let's give it over to ramblin joe <laughs> weird take it ramblin joe yeah. take it ramblin joe they really made it feel like a lighthearted romp in the mm -hmm. trailer um and they also you can't hear it because it's you know on the screen or whatever but they count john cusack as part of the all-star cast which okay oh wow I mean, he is in this movie. Yep. He does. I mean, he, he did a, a day. <laughs> he did. Yep. He wore a hat. He, he did a great job. So, uh, hi, I'm Chrissy. I am uh, the director of the Neighborhood Comedy Theater in downtown Mesa, Arizona. And uh, with me is my podcast co-host. Nathan Blackwell. Hello. Um, a Phoenix-based filmmaker. Greetings. Greetings. I suck at intros. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with us today once again is uh one of our favorite guests handsome tommy metz the third how are you sir a jingle 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 i'm doing great <laughs> <laughs> I, I cannot get over how weird that trailer sounded i'm doing great it's so such a pleasure to be back it's a very banjo forward. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we're talking Stand By Me. Uh, this is a favorite of yours, isn't it, Tommy? It absolutely is, yes. And this was a great choice because I've seen this movie, I think, 900 times, but mm -hmm. I haven't watched it in years. So to go mm -hmm. back and rewatch it for this was really exciting. Awesome. Uh, and what about you, Nathan? Is this something you've seen a bunch of times? Um, I, I've definitely seen it maybe like two or three times, but it's been, yeah, it's been like 15 years. Wow. Yeah. Same for me too. I haven't watched it in, I think I went to see like a, you know, um, cult classic movie screening of it, but that would have <laughs> been many, many years ago. Um, and I think I've only seen it like a handful of times. I definitely haven't seen it enough to be like memorize it. And yet I'm pretty sure I could quote most of it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Once it starts, you're like, oh, wait, I know exactly where this scene exactly. goes. Exactly. And I was, if you oh, said it came out in 86, I was 11. So I was right in the sweet spot when yeah. this came out. Yeah. It was that's like, one of the reasons that it was such a huge influence for me. Made for mm -hmm. you. And it's one of these like 80s, 80s, 50s movies. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. The the eighties was a a uh, uh, a ripe time to l experience the fifties. Yeah. I. It's like Back to the Future was part of that. It's like you need that like thirty plus years, like thirty years, to kind of then get nostalgic about a, a certain time mm. for it to be like to to be able to define it. Oh, that was the eighties. Like enough time has passed, and and for it to become a novelty. 
Like I remember 50s diners popping up and that being so exciting mm. and fun as someone who mm -hmm. never experienced the 50s. Yeah. Well, what did you think, uh, Tommy, as being right in the sweet spot? Were you like, these 50s kids are right up my alley? Yeah, they were right up. Well, because the thing that works, I well, here, I guess I, I'll keep it light for now. But um, yes, it was right up my alley because I recognized my own friends in a lot of them. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. so much that I didn't. I didn't understand moons and goochers and like there are a bunch of right. different things. But um the playfulness, especially in that opening scene when they meet up in the treehouse, and there's mm -hmm. so much camaraderie while also busting each other so much and so mercilessly. That's just how kids at that age are, and I thought it really nailed that aspect to it. It looked familiar. I love mm -hmm. that, and it, that the busting each other and stuff is like a, such a wholesome take on what like eventually becomes a toxic trait. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> exactly um, and i think they talk about it a lot in the movie is like the the meanest thing you could say about your friend's mother is always the best way to go um <laughs> bonding over uh being as mean to each other as possible um so as you said well we actually start with richard dreyfus uh driving along yeah as, the road. as a framing device for the film you know yeah. of, i did not remember i remember the end because I, because the very last yeah. lines of the movie are iconic for me, uh, because they're the same as the original novella. Uh, but I did not remember when he showed up in a, like a pickup truck. I was like, "Oh no, I read the wrong movie," <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have pickup truck Richard Dreyfus, and I was like, "Oh right." And then when you, I heard his voice, I was like. Oh, right. Like that voice is so I'm going to have to use the word iconic. Yeah, a lot. My he's apologies. the Daniel that Stern voice. to the Wonder Years. Yes. And it's just like, uh, right. I knew it was Richard Dreyfus, but I kind of didn't like I had forgotten. It was just the voice, which was fascinating. And there's not a ton of like of that in there. It's sort of like the beginning and the end. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, they use it kind of as transition moments, you know, they, yeah. they, I, I think they use it like at least three more times, you know, where he's like, they're framing like the mythology of like the junkyard dog and like, mm -hmm. and these private little moments of looking back. But um, yeah, it's a really effective device because at the beginning, he's looking at a newspaper about someone who, who died in a diner. And so it immediately starts us off with that he's looking back because of death and of loss, mm -hmm. you know, which, which kind of becomes the theme, the, the umbrella that kind of hangs over the whole movie. And you know that, the, that these kids are, are in for a lot. Yeah. It's a really fun kids death movie. <laughs> uh, that's Stephen King. He well, we just did uh, we just did Pet Cemetery. Oof! And uh, you know that's a that's also a fun kids and pets death uh, death movie. Yep. <laughs> so yes, and then we cut right to the gambling, smoking children, which are adorable. <laughs> yep. Uh, and as it said in the trailer, what a cast we've got: River Phoenix, Will Wheaton, Corey Feldman. And a a very plump and precious Jerry O'Connell. <laughs> They're a great team, and they immediately feel like besties. And it launches right in. That was another thing I I didn't remember too. Is there's not a lot of like um, build up. It's just like, hey guys, happy summertime or happy Labor Day weekend. Do you want to go see a dead body? <laughs> right. <laughs> it just. <laughs> That's the thing that's right uh, right from the beginning. And they're all like, yes, of course we want to walk for two days to go see a dead body. Let's put this plan together. And it was because I was a little confused about who was whose older, younger brother. Because uh, there's also a gang of hoodlums. So there's our gang of kids. But there's also a gang of hoodlums uh, led by mm -hmm. Kiefer Sutherland. And they're all like the older or like some of them are older brothers of our gang. Eyeball. Eyeball is the older brother. Yep. He's the older brother of Chris, but or Chris or it was Kirk? River Phoenix, right? It it I thought it was River Phoenix's older brother, but I could be wrong. I think so too. I think it's Chris's older brother. And he's the reason they... why one of the reasons why no everyone thinks that Chris Chambers will never 
grow up to be worth anything is partly right. because of eyeball. Because he is Kiefer Sutherland's right hand hoodlum. Right. But the kid who was under the porch, uh, Chubby Jerry O'Connell, he overheard his older brother oh, right. talking about the dead, bro- the dead body. Mm, so mm-hmm. I think like there's a lot of older brothers in the older gang. Right. So that's how he heard about the dead body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do say uh, about the hoodlums, this I think is the scariest, and I'm including things like the Lost Boys and stuff. This is the scariest that I think Kiefer Sutherland has ever been. Mm. Partly because, mm-hmm. I mean, just because he's so realistic. Yeah. And he's got a knife. He just, he just, I, I mean, I just remember so many things of the toothpick going back and forth as he's playing chicken in the car with the truck mm-hmm. and stuff. He's just, he's the coolest and also the scariest in the entire world. Oh, he's very, very yeah, scary. For sure. Yeah. And, and so appealing. <laughs> I know. I didn't get that same reaction, but I want to know. Sorry. More. I sorry. wanted him to like me. Yeah. Like, no, I didn't want to be beaten up by him. I would totally be his eyeball, which sucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he was definitely like, like Kiefer Sutherland in this movie is magnetic. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got that 80s, 50s bad boy cool. I think he looks exactly the same as he does in The Lost Boys. That's like, funny. He's got the same haircut. <laughs> yeah. uh, he just has more earrings in The Lost Boys. But he is absolutely great as the head of the Cobras. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. hoodlum gang. Um, <laughs> and then they're giving each other those tattoos with the razor blade. Oh, <sighs> it's so unsanitary. <laughs> We hadn't invented tetanus yet, so everything was fine. <laughs> uh, but I like that they, like, I, I want to imagine that they picked the kid with the best handwriting. They're like, you got the best <laughs> handwriting, eyeball. You do it. Okay. <laughs> I did pass fourth grade. So they sort of cook up this whole uh, plan to uh, each lie to the other's parents, you know, like kids do. And then they're going to walk out to go see this dead body. And their plan is to say that they they found this missing boy and be heroes. Yeah. So everyone is super jazzed about this body because they're they're basically living unremarkable lives and they need some they need to be like some degree of fame. You know, I think wasn't there a reward or something like that? Also, like just anything to make them seem to stand out and to seem special. Mm hmm. And especially for a Will Wheaton character, Gordy, who calls himself the invisible boy, whose parents just don't care about him anymore since his older brother, Denny, died. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, boy, is that sad. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And yeah, his brother. So so Will Wheaton is the, the Richard Dreyfuss character looking back. And so he is really dealing in a in more than anyone else is, again, dealing with death. His yeah. his brother just died, and I think in the flashback it's like, oh man, he died four months ago, and the parents still haven't gotten over it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> but yeah, everyone is his parents are just kind of like walking ghosts right now because they yeah. they had the favorite son, and Will and Will Wheaton wasn't him. Nope, Will Wheaton is the creative, sensitive, the sensitive boy sensitive boy and john cusack was a football man so yeah you gotta love the football man more and, and this a... this small town is not for for sensitive little boys you know everyone no. it's it's all you realize is like everyone is is really trying to survive like everything is about survival like it, there's mm. nothing to do so people are bored they drink they get into trouble they bully each other life is rough and and really kind of goes into like the whole story is a lot is about loss of innocence for these boys. It's Castle Rock, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. Well, that's what I think works. What makes this movie work? When I rewatched it uh, last night, I was blown away by how close. And it's so funny. That I think maybe that's why I'm obsessed with that trailer music. How close it could be, corny. Yeah. How close mm-hmm. to corny and like 
you know, Sandlot is a very different kind of movie, but that kind of that trailer makes it sound like a wacky, mm-hmm. oh no, mm-hmm. I tripped on my own <laughs> shoes kind of thing. But right from the beginning, they set up that there is, even for young kids, there is violence and there yeah. is horror in the world. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yeah, the terror that can come from a town where there's just not enough things to do, people will find things to do. They will create their own excitement. And as a result, I mean, it's very dairy esque in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And it mm-hmm. also had the idea of disappearing once your sibling is taken from yep. the family. Then he's like trying to convince his dad to go check out the barrows. And his dad's like, put it all away, put it all away. We have to not talk about this at all. So mm-hmm. King really gets into that. And this movie, without it, it would have just been, it's just so. The way that it's shot, the way that everything, the music and stuff, it could have been corny or hokey in an instant. But that threatening kind of thing that that, that Nathan was talking about really keeps it on this side and makes it work. I yeah, think. I think so, too, because there is so mm-hmm. much there's so much of uh, all the other like boys will be boys uh, kind of movies. The Sandlot, very similar with the Junkyard Dog uh goonies with the whole barf interlude somewhere in the middle right. um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah their stories and their like mythology that can be silly you know like them yeah. telling each other stories or almost kind of like a christmas story it's like oh the mythology of the dogs and how we all <laughs> fear the great demon dog of cerebus <laughs> or or whatever you know like that can be silly because it's their own mindset but if but as soon as that happens, like they've got the mythology of the junkyard dog who who's who was trained to sick balls, you know, chopper. Uh, yep. Yeah, chopper. And then and then the reality, like we think, OK, so we think the twist is the comedy is that it's just like a a, a small little golden retriever or whatever like that, yeah. like a cute little dog. But then it turns out that the real like left turn is is the old man, whatever of the junkyard. Like he, when he shows up and he knows exactly who they are and it's right. less, Oh, I'm going to get you kids. And it's like, I know who your dad is, you know? And then it's, it's, he's able to push, push their buttons and to know who they are and not mm-hmm. just by their names, but like, you know, by, you know, like he really goes after Corey Feldman's dad and, right. and Looney, talks Looney, about Looney. Right, who we already knew was kind of like a little who was who who beat them, and he was he had put uh, you know Corey Feldman's ear against like a a burner or something like that. So we al- we already knew that there was at least two abusive dads in these four kids, you know. Uh-huh. Right, but but we're able to kind of realize that each of these kids are kind of haunted by something, you know. Yeah, Corey Feldman's dad is like a PTSD war uh, survivor. And like Chris's dad, River Phoenix's dad is like, he says, you know, they're a whole family of, of hoodlums. Um, and then you got a Gordy's dad. Well, Wheaton's dad is just like a neglectful father who loved the other son more. So like mm-hmm. no good dads, no, no good dads in this bunch. I love Nathan's th- uh, thing that the whole theme is survival because the adults don't help. Right. There are a fair amount of adults in this adultless thing. and But whenever they're there, it really highlights there's no help for survival from them. Mm-hmm. If anything, they will make the situation worse. Right. Yeah. Um, and they... The I I like too that Nathan that you brought up a Christmas story because in a Christmas mm-hmm. story the kid says you know you either become a bully or you get bullied and mm-hmm. it seems like mm-hmm. that's kind of the theme for these guys here too is like you either become a hoodlum or you become a victim of the hoodlum uh huh and and then they even bully like Jerry O'Connell they bully yeah. him he he is like the one on, the lowest one on on their totem pole. And then within the group of of the cobras, uh, the bullies, they're all <laughs> mercilessly bullied as well. Like yep. there's no safety in that group either. You're if you're not Kiefer Sutherland, you're a victim of Kiefer Sutherland. Yep. Um. There's no safety <laughs> anywhere. No. Ugh. It, it's so. Uh. But for as like dark and sort of 
bleak as it is, it's also still cheerful and funny. Yeah, mm-hmm. as, there's, as a movie. It's, and there's it's, so it's, much friendship and strength in numbers also mm-hmm. at the yeah. same time. And then these little weird interludes like the deer. I always found that to be kind of magical when he wakes up and sees the deer and then yeah. Richard Dreyfus shows up and goes, I've never told anyone until just now. And I was like, okay, that, oh. I'm glad that was in there. Had it not right. been in there, I wouldn't that have noticed. That was the last deer I ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> that deer was stabbed in a diner and you're like, what's happening? Oh, hey, what? no. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> He's no, reading the deer it. news. <laughs> <laughs> right, the deer news. <laughs> and there he was on page one. The deer <laughs> I saw. Like- it balances these moments of like after the junkyard man uh, completely rips into uh, poor little Corey Feldman, who is the most like on edge of all of these boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, he He's like he wants to like dodge the train. He's like already like this crazy mm-hmm. death wish kid yeah. at yeah. 12. After the junkyard man rips into him, he is like he goes to pieces. He just is like crying and crying, and um, they're all there for him. Uh, later, you know, a couple times, uh, River Phoenix's character Chris goes to pieces about how he'll never get out of this town, and no one will ever see him as anything other than you know um, being just like his dad and his brothers and all this. Uh, Will Wheaton's character gets to go to pieces about how he wasn't even that sad about his brother because he didn't really know him uh, and how his parents like completely abandoned him. Like in between all these like really deep, meaningful, beautiful, powerful, emotional speeches delivered by children. um, There's also like a 10 minute barf scene. Right. Yes. Which was notorious. Like there's, there's like two moments in this movie that just that you if when you watch it as a kid, it's very different than watching it as an adult. You know, if you watch it as a kid, you remember the puking scene. You remember the leeches. You know, like you are more tied into their adventure and and the mythology. But as an adult, you are seeing that loss of innocence you know mm-hmm. and as, as as an adult like you're on the edge of tears like a couple of times you mm-hmm. know just thinking about the m- mortality and how things change um but yeah that puking scene that is and i think the only way they got away with it is because it's so melodramatic and and it's also purple right you know because of the of the pie the pie like if it was it's like, well, how do we put this? How do we have a scene of everyone puking and not have the audience actually puke? <laughs> you know, like how do you how do you pull that off? I'm in danger. I I like can't watch that scene. Oh really? I can't uh-huh. watch it. <laughs> no, it's too much for me. I the leeches too even get me, uh, which is oh. like another another mm-hmm. silly moment in the movie. Um, and I I should have asked at the beginning, but um. Have you have either of you read the novella, the body yes. this is based on? Tommy has. I have from different seasons. No. Tell us, uh, tell us about how it uh, uh, compares and contrasts. I I really vigorously nodded, but it's been so long <laughs> since I read it, I shouldn't have been so confident. One of the things that I remember explicitly from it um, is how smart the movie is when it stops, when it does, mm-hmm. because the novella you stay with the boys a little bit. And he talks about how at different times they got hunted down by the gang and like they got their arms broken and they got like when, when Kiefer Sutherland says, I'm not going to forget this is big time, baby. He's not lying. Like they don't Mm. just sort of get away with it. Uh, But Mm. that's not, that takes away from some of the fun you in the novella. You kind of want it. Like it makes sense. Cause you're like, Oh, I'm so scared. But the movie is smart to just sort of end with them parting ways because yeah, the novella just keeps going and they're like, yeah, they get the S kicked out of them. All of them at different times. Yeah. I was really curious about that. It's like at the end of Lord of the Rings, let's just end it when they're like victorious and not when like the hobbits return and Hobbiton is actually burned down. (laughs) Yeah. I was so, I was so worried about that though. I was like, Oh my God, they're going to get killed by these mean hoodlums. Um, Oh yeah. Also, 
I was just like struck by how easy it would be for the hoodlums to get busted for running a logging truck off the road. Like all that guy <laughs> has to do is be yeah, like, yeah. it was Kiefer Sutherland. And they'll be like, oh yeah, yeah the town hoodlum. Yeah. We, they do how did not you know? Right because futures. there's nine yeah. people in this town. <laughs> yeah. Within two years, half those those dudes are in jail for sure. Yeah. Well, that's that- what I wanted to know too, was I wanted to know what happened to all of them. I don't remember, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, because there's also, like in the movie, there's a lot of just growing apart. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Like how he says that what's his name tries to go into the army. He's not allowed. He spends time in jail. But he even him and Chris, when they go to law school and stuff, they all just slide away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Which so, is like, this is what happens, right? right? Yeah. Um, are you a big Stephen King uh, guy, Tommy? Enormous. Enormous. For better or worse, yes, I've read. I think pretty much everything, <laughs> wow, and his that's and his son and Joe Hill. Wow, I'm wow. a big fan wow. of his son wow. too. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, it was. I got started in read. I started reading younger than a lot of my friends, and my dad had given me. Um, I still have it. It's right up there. Skeleton Crew. I started oh. with short stories because I was mm-hmm. too worried about a novel. I'd forget who the characters were, and then I moved on to Night Shift, and then the first real book I read was Eyes of the Dragon. Wow. Uh, yeah, uh, where Roland starts his tales or he makes his first thing. So yeah, I've read a ton. And he's not I wouldn't it's interesting. I wouldn't say he's necessarily my favorite author, but when a, he releases a book, I will 100% read it. Well, there's so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. That's Yeah, I know. It goes it's a deep deep well. Yeah, I got it. I really wish I figured out a way to monetize it. Uh but the thing about different if you are you familiar with different seasons? The the I I read it many 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 moons ago. Okay, yeah, because the thing about it is it's four novellas and mm-hmm. out of it came Stand by Me, Shawshank Redemption and App Pupil are all oh, from right. that. And then right, there's a fourth right, right. one called uh, Breathing Method that Scott Derrickson was attached to, but no one's talked about mm. that in like five years. And it's not mm. very good. Yeah. Do you have any like strong preferences in the Stephen King uh, universe? Mm, boy, oh boy, there's 900. That would have been a great question for me to think about ahead of time. Okay. You well, know what? I can, tell you, I can tell you my favorite thing that he's written. And if I ever had the chance to make something, it would be this. Okay. It's the novella in the Bachman books uh, called The Long Walk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that, The Long Walk. I read, I read that at least once a year. Uh, I'm wow. fascinated by Garrity and all of those people. And it's a, there's a really good version of it also on um, audiobooks. The read, I don't remember who the reader is, but it's just, I think I'm fascinated by everything about that story. I was thinking that The Long Walk might be a good um, deep cut recommendation since there's so much damn oh. walking. Sure. <laughs> He's really, <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, yeah. Excellent. So, um, okay. And I sort of like gotten us totally off the track of the movie, but <laughs> of course they, they walk, they have their adventures, they um, have a gun. Mm-hmm. Which yeah, we, that's scary. That, that's the I think the scariest thing is that they just have a gun. Yeah, each of you take a turn. Uh, what you know, being the the lookout at night, and so like Jerry O'Connell is like holding it with like his finger right on the trigger, <laughs> like moving around everything that 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 makes a noise. Like, oh my god. Yeah, and uh, I think Kiefer Sutherland says to him like give that to me before you take your foot off. And I was like, please give it to someone before somebody <laughs> yeah, right. shoots their foot off. Uh-huh. <laughs> give it to the dead kid. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they do, uh, they do eventually find the, uh, the body right at the exact moment that Kiefer Sutherland and the Cobras uh, find the dead body. Um, and they all want to bring it in they all want to take it with them, which I was like, I couldn't wrap my head around. Uh, yeah. It's like, let's build a stretcher and take it back. It's like, uh, oh, God. that was a two day walk friend. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> 
You think it'll be easier going through the leech pit, like hoisting a dead body up <laughs> over your shoulders? Hurry across the the rail track! Hurry, hurry! hurry. Being oh chased. They're all like the exact same adventures, but they're all kind of bored. Oh no, yeah, leeches! What, what if the buddy? movie started with them? With the stretcher taking the body days across, like what was? What if that was the movie? <laughs> oh, that's the adventure. Oh, Just bringing back the body. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's Stand by Me too. Yeah, Oof. standing by. Um, uh-huh. uh, but the but the cobras also wanted to take it back. Like they were just going to prop it up in the back of the muscle car. <laughs> right, right. Weekend to Bernie style. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants to transpo this dead body. They um, run the same logging truck off the road. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it, I, just, I just got all these logs back up. I just threw <laughs> each hand by hand back onto the truck. <laughs> um, <laughs> but of course, like Will Wheaton has this deep realization that they're like, he's like, no one's going to touch this body. Like, we're just going to, we need, he needs to like have his dignity and. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not. It's not about us. It's about him. Um, so he has this like deep and profound realization. But they do yeah. have a gun versus knife standoff mm-hmm. uh, during all of it, um, which is pretty intense. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Because again, you a hundred percent buy that Kiefer Sutherland is going to cut this dude. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. When he pulls out that switchblade, like you know that he is not going to back down. Yeah, and even with the gun, you're scared the whole time about what's mm-hmm. going to happen to poor little Will Wheaton. Um, but what a nice piece of acting by uh, very, very, very young actors. Uh, yeah. They're all mm-hmm. so good in this movie. I think that's part of what makes it such an enduring and endearing classic is that these kids are all killer. Yeah actors just slaying what is a very tough movie to act in. Mm -hmm. And this is during Rob Reiner's meteoric run as a director. I mean, he Ah. could not miss Mm -hmm. all different genres, all everything. And then came North and it all disappeared. (laughs) Something happened with that Elijah Wood movie because he just never got it back. But yeah, he was just on a roll Mm -hmm. in Castle Rock, Entertainment was just on a roll that no one had ever seen from someone like that. It was fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did he do after this? Was it The Princess Bride? He has Princess Bride. He has A Few Good Men. Harry Met he Sally. Has, yep. Yeah. A Few Good Men when Harry Met Sally. A bunch. I love A Few Good Men. Yeah. Um, yes. He's quite a good director. And and when I saw that he directed this, I was like, I because I didn't know. I was like, what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mr. Princess Bride directed this very sad, very like complex sort of movie. Um, but yeah, he did a he did a great job. And, and that's sort of the so at the end, with the very, very nice bookend, which I appreciated so much, is that like the standoff ends, the boys walk back, but they just walk straight back. Mm-hmm. They don't even like stop. They just walk all the way home. Um, and they anonymous phone call to let them know where the the boy is. Roy Brower is that his name? Ray, Ray, Ray Brower. They do an anonymous phone call to let them know uh, that the body is out there. Um, and they like go their separate ways to go back to school, where it's like sort of made clear during the movie that uh, Vern. And Gordy will go into like college prep classes and uh, Vern or no, not Vern, Teddy and Chris will go into like shop classes. I guess that in uh, junior high, you have to decide your whole future <laughs> at this time. Oof. Oof. Um, uh, so they're sort of like uh, kind of parting ways a little bit at the end. Um, and then we get back to Richard Dreyfus who kind of tells us the story of how it all worked out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and right before that, because we remember at the beginning that one of them died and we're reminded that it was River Phoenix's character, you right. know? 
And and there's this heartbreaking shot, this moment to where uh, Will Wheaton and him part ways and we see River Phoenix walking away and they do th- this dissolve. So he just fades away. Mm-hmm. You know, they fade to, to a shot with him out of it. And so it looks like he just disappears. Mm-hmm. And oh, that there got me. Go. Ugh. That was the first time that I'd heard the phrase, I'll see you around, not if I see you first. Oh. Yeah, I'd never. And I it was decades later that I understood it. Right. That it means I if I see you it. first, I will go the mm-hmm. other direction. <laughs> it's one of those things you really only appreciate as an adult. Right. I was always just, I don't know what I thought it meant, but not <laughs> right. that. Not if I see you first, because then you'll, oh, okay, so then we'll see each other and wave. Yeah. I just never questioned it. But then I love that dissolve is amazing. Yeah, I I too always Oof. thought uh, I'll see you later. Not if I see you first. Meant like I'll be looking for you. I'm looking. For yeah, you. that's what I thought. That's what it was. Yeah, I'm gonna see because I'm just gonna be. I'm behind gonna see you, you first. Right. I'm gonna be I, shall be watching you sleep. <laughs> yes. And then I realized, oh no, it means I don't want to see. You. <laughs> yeah. <Right. laughs> um, but I think the thing that I thought was really really nice was that uh. The Richard Dreyfus uh, has a son and a friend who are like wanting to go to the community pool, it seems mm-hmm. like, because they have yep. towels mm-hmm. over their necks. And he's like, yeah, 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 I'll get there, I'll get there. But in the end, he does go like play with them and hang right. out with them. And I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. thank God. Thank God that these kids will have <laughs> right. a dad. Right. Shut <laughs> up, I'm trying to write. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, I'm going to take you to the take you to the pool and play with you it's like okay so he learned a lesson at least to be a good Mm -hmm. dad to finally be a good dad finally the 80s parents were all perfect as we know (laughs) you see him doing a huge rail of cocaine in the back Uh and then he goes to the pool yeah let's go to the Uh pool kids um (laughs) ready to crush this pool (laughs) i thought that me i thought that felt nice yeah uh to see boys with a with a dad who seemed to want to be with them Mm-hmm. as an end um but of course it was we get the really sad uh sad stories of what happens to everybody and uh that's that's stand by me man mm-hmm. um there how how well do you guys think it held up like on a scale of one leech uh, <laughs> to to ten leeches yeah. Uh, now, ten- now, bear in mind, if there's 10 leeches on your body, some of them are going to be in places you don't want them to be. So careful on how you rate them. <laughs> it's true. But 10 leeches is the best amount of leeches. Because uh-huh. um, <laughs> we're, we're pro leech here. Rate it in terms of like holding up because there's a lot of uh, a lot of the R word, a lot of the um, uh, three letter F word um they call each other pussy constantly just Mm -hmm. constantly i think it's the if you were doing a drinking game rule and that was one you would um (laughs) go to the hospital (laughs) um uh and so there's just that that like sort of languagey uh stuff that uh is maybe not um i don't know it's like ooh, i would bleep it I would just bleep it and feel a lot better, <laughs> but maybe that's uh, maybe that doesn't count since it's an '80s movie that takes place in the '50s. Yeah, for for the time it takes place in and the boy the 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 type of kids and environment they were in, this is pretty tame for probably what actually happened. Hmm. You think so? Yeah, language wise. Uh, it doesn't uh, impact how well it holds up for you. How many how many leeches do you give it? No, I I didn't feel like yeah. I, I, as whenever they use those words, my thinking in this is like, oh, it was probably a way worse word back then. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. um, yeah. For me, oh yeah, this this it had been a while, and so a lot of things hit me fresh. It, this movie really hit me in the feels. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, 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 th- I feel like I, I gotta give this, uh, nine leeches. Ooh. Okay. I was expecting some really high numbers. So, uh-huh. uh, nine leeches, uh, works. What do you think, Tommy? How many leeches? Nine. I will nine also leeches. say nine leeches. Mm-hmm. Although Oof. being completely honest, I cannot 
when I was watching it last night, I realized at one point I was also kind of watching myself watch it. Ah. In a way that I cannot take this away from growing up with it. Mm-hmm. Like the nostalgia mm-hmm. and stuff like this. It's not kind of like, oh, I'm sort of seeing this scene from up on high. I was watching it again for the first time. It's just so much a part of my life. And I used to, I bought the soundtrack. It's one of the first cassettes that I had <laughs> uh, and stuff like that, that I own with like my own money and stuff like this. And I was, that was, so I'm walking around like listening to every day, <laughs> like so weird. It made mm-hmm. me less cool. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I was, this movie was, was such an impactful thing and it being uh Stephen King and the kids and everything. So I I I give it a nine, but with the sort of uh acknowledgement that I'm not seeing it with new eyes. I don't think that mm. that would be possible. Okay. I was voicing along with the movie like how you were saying you could probably uh quote about quote, I was doing it just I realized like under my breath of like suck my fat one you cheap dime store hood like the entire time I'm just doing lines. <laughs> so, uh-huh. yeah. Um was there anything that stood out to you as being like f- hitting different than than back then or it all just like uh fell right into place? The gun, the 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 use of the gun for comedy mm-hmm. when you brought up Vern having it, it's still really funnily shot when yeah. he's behind the tree and then the gun pops out every time uh the owl hoots or whatever it mm-hmm. is. It's still funny, but it does have that kind of like Oof. we yeah. guns uh-huh. were really different in movies for you know, we we were using them differently. Guns and children were not did not have the same horrible connotation that it yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. It's true. Um, yeah, that was it for me too. So I, I, I totally support, uh, all of the nine leeches. I will give it eight leeches just because of the seeing of the gun, yeah. um, and just the, uh, uh, unsupervised pointing of the gun <laughs> at all of the children <laughs> really just, oh my God. It, it like for me now, and I had this like feeling when we watched Heather's too, like for me now, it's just mm. like, oh, it makes the mm-hmm. bile like rise up in my, yeah. in my throat. I, I, I feel in Heather's that hurt it, but I felt like in in Stand By Me, it helped it. Like it, oh. it, it made it more dangerous. It made it more difficult to watch. And I think it that, it, that it was an it was an up rather than a down. Mm -hmm. we're in heathers you know it's it's a farce and it's like teenage shootings uh, i'm I'm having a hard time enjoying (laughs) (laughs) and yeah the gun also really works and stand by me in the realisticness again to go back to survival yeah when adults are not there when everything is on the line you have to bring a gun to a knife fight Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. when left to no Mm -hmm. other devices, there's no talking down. There's no dance number. You just have to outgun the other person, which is terrible. But that's what this entire movie is about. I think that part was my was like the most impactful part of the whole thing. Like after you had seen Kiefer Sutherland, like staring down this poor logging man truck um, (laughs) and just like not flinching uh, to see Will Wheaton staring him down with a gun and not flinching was like. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wowie wow wow. Um <laughs> good job, Will Wheaton. And good job, Kiefer Sutherland. Like Kiefer Sutherland is so menacing. Yeah. Um, but I, I hope that he was pleasant to be around. <laughs> I, don't know. I hope he's I hope he's a nice person. I hope so. Chrissy he's wants so to scary. be a cobra so bad. <laughs> so. I would let them give me all the tetanus. Yeah, um, I see I see the razor blade behind you. <laughs> oh, that's weird. Yeah. That's weird. You're making me mess up the snake part. Um, <laughs> so what is your deep cut recommendation? If people like Stand By Me, what would they uh, what would they find to latch on to in another movie, uh, Nathan? Um, so mine is, I, I, it's, it's ultimately, my, I guess my deep cut re- recommendations are based off of like my reaction to like stand by me like being in being now middle-aged um and and, like watching movies and and seeing them differently as an adult you know um and this one just being like on the precipice of tears and thinking about mortality 
And so I, I would say if you want to continue to have that experience <laughs> and and you and you want to burst into tears at at fading people, I recommend Field of Dreams. Oh, um, love it. Yeah, that it, it oh, kind good. of continues like the same thing of like, OK, looking back as a child, thinking about mortality and change and how, you know, and how life is there's less life ahead of you than there is behind you. Um, Field of Dreams kind of continues that with like the the transition of like, I am now the father, you know, like, you know, my father is now maybe younger than what I was when he died, you know, mm. and then just again, f the, the the sadness of the shots at people fading away. <laughs> oh, it <Yeah>. gets me <laughs> like, so if you want to just like cry all night. See, so stand by me, and then feel the dreams. You're welcome. What a double feature! What an unexpected but uh, right, perfect exactly double feature. Yeah, I love if it. We wanna, if dissolves. we want to contemplate death, yeah, dissolves on train tracks or corn, and the loss of <laughs> innocence. Yeah. Um, what's yours, Tommy? Um, keeping it in the King family and keeping it with the reality of, unfortunately, violence, even when you're very young. Uh, and survival of children and having to figure it out when uh, adults are no help or are part of the problem. I'm going much darker. The kids okay. in this movie are much more peril, but it's uh, the adaptation by Scott Derrickson, the aforementioned Scott Derrickson, of Joe Hill, Stephen King's son, short story, The Black Phone. Mm. Oh, I love mm -hmm. The Black Phone. I, I'm blown away by that movie. And the acting, the kids are so good. Mm -hmm. Everyone is so good. And Scott Derrickson sh films Kids in Peril because he also did Sinister. He does. Mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. He gets amazing performances out of it and treads the line of, all right. <laughs> like yeah. the, this is too young to be doing such horrific or intimating such horrific things. But he does it in a way that just blows me away. So The Black Phone is mine. Uh, cool. killer, killer recommendation. I loved the black phone and I have a hard time with kids in peril. Yeah. Um, but the black phone did it, um, did it in a really great way. I did not know that was based on a, a novella. Yeah. Yeah. Um, an, a perfect one. Now, now mine feels really stupid. Uh, I wish I could, <laughs> I, I wish I could take the easy way out and say my right, deep right. cut was the and long this is where we, This <laughs> is where we have an edit in the show. And then since you're editing it, you can, you can insert it at any time. Like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, I have to say what mine was. Oh, but we should say the long walk. Uh, cause we didn't say what it's about. It's a Stephen King, uh, short story where um it's like the it's the you know it's the sad future where all of the children in in an area have to walk until there's only one left and if they fall um behind the pace they get shot um mm. and some of them just just die from like exhaustion and stuff along the way it, it's kind of like then, conan where it's like the wheel of pain where only mm -hmm. one can be yeah. left <laughs> Only one can be left and you're supposed to get like untold riches or whatever. But of course there's like a twist and there's more to it than that and everything. So that would be a better deep cut recommendation than the one I'm going to do. Whoever um, wins is... gets a, a chocolate factory. <laughs> <laughs> um, mine was kind of uh, like, and Nathan already mentioned it, but if you really like walking, lots and lots of walking <laughs> with mm. some, uh, with some nice moments of feel, and you've already seen the Lord the of the Rings game. movies. That's the one. Of my world. That's my recommendation. Is the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> Got to see the Lord of the Rings because there's lots is, of walking. Is there like a BuzzFeed of like w movies about walking? Top five <laughs> movies about walking. <laughs> uh, so that's why you've got recommendation because there's lots and lots of walking, but there's like poignant moments whenever they stop. Uh, and there's you know exciting things instead of leeches there's balrogs but it's very that's similar. true they have um, the obstacles they learn something about each other they mm -hmm. do uh so tommy where can people find your podcasts and your films and support all of your wonderful work Sure. Our film, my feature film, 30 Nights uh, of Sex to Save Your Marriage, is currently on Tubi. We were on Amazon Prime for a long time, but now we're on Tubi. Prestigious. Tubi. 
and uh, my short film Static, which is the first horror film that I've ever made, uh, is have been having a nice festival run, and we're about to be in New York. Oh, uh, awesome! In May, which is very cool. And podcasts, cool. Um, we have we're actually changing it right now, but. Uh, the great podcast with a terrible name, What's That Smell? I do with Pete Wright. It's a comedic <laughs> uh, podcast about uh, anxiety, but we are actually changing it. It's going to be season eight starting later this year, and we Ooh. have a big, big change coming. So that's exciting. And then, of course, The Next Reel. I'm on that with people. The Next Reel is a movie review podcast, also on truestory.fm. Thank you. Excellent. Those are all, all high recommendations. Um uh, and very exciting. I can't wait to find out what the new twist is going to be. Um, yeah, me too. No, we, just, <laughs> we just figured it out. <laughs> um, what about you, Nathan? Where can people find uh, your film? I did a, a low-budget feature film, um, and we are, uh, we're, when recording today, March 20th, um, we're playing uh, the Phoenix Film Festival, which should probably be over by the time this episode comes out. Awesome. Um, and yeah, so we're just beginning to start our film festival tour. I hope to have um, different festivals that I can announce uh, throughout the called? year, I guess. It's called The Last Movie Ever Made. Um, and you can uh, check it out on all the social medias. Um, we're also at, at our production company, Squishy Studios, which is a name you pick like 15 years ago. And it's like, oh, now we've <laughs> got to have like respectable projects. And, and I don't want to have to create a new LLC, you know, yeah. so I guess Squishy Why you don't Studios. let the kid name the dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you've got to have at least like a goofy looking like wink, wink, like production company logo. It's like, yeah, we know it's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, uh, squishystudios.com to check out um, future uh, festival dates. Okay. Uh, and you can find me at the Neighborhood Comedy Theater, the actual place in downtown Mesa, Arizona, doing comedy for you live on stage uh, every Friday and Saturday night, as well as other various special events. Uh, you can hear me in addition to this podcast on the Cool Time Dice Hour, uh, which is a, a live actual role play game uh, podcast Ooh. I do with uh, Kyle Olson, who is also of uh, True Story FM fame. Uh, so uh, look for that coming up because we have a lot of dates in April and May uh, where if you're in the Arizona uh, greater downtown Mesa area, you can come see us play live and then hear it in the podcast. And it's lots of fun. Or you can just listen to it on True Story FM. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you so much for uh, being a guest, uh, Tommy. It and... is an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Thanks, Tommy. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when you're out there in the world, uh, you know, crossing rivers full of leeches and finding uh, dead bodies. Be sure to keep the most excellent 80s movies podcast motto in mind. Be excellent to each other and party on. Party dudes. on, dudes. Okay. Yay. We did it.